Chapter 3 The Goods Market The determination of output is the fundamental issue of macroeconomics. Output is always determined by the condition that supply equals demand. In the short run, year to year, we assume that firms are willing to supply any quantity at a given price. Production automatically adjusts to changes in demand. Thus, in the short run, output is effectively determined by demand. Many factors affect demand, from consumer confidence to the state of the financial system to fiscal and monetary policy. In the medium run, 5 to 10 years, supply determines output. So amount of saving, investment, capital and technology determine output. In the long run, over decades, growth in saving, investment, and technological change determine output. In this chapter, we focus on understanding the key components of demand and the interactions among production, income, and demand. This chapter also shows how fiscal policy affects output. If you remember one basic message from this chapter, it should be, in the short run, demand determines output. Chapter 3 outlines the goods market. Section 3.1 looks at the composition of GDP and the different sources of the demand for goods. Section 3.2 looks at the determinants of the demand for goods. Section 3.3 shows how equilibrium output is determined by the condition that the production of goods must be equal to the demand for goods. Section 3.4 gives an alternative way of thinking about goods market equilibrium based on the equality of investment and saving. Section 3.5 looks at the effects of fiscal policy on equilibrium output. Let us begin by understanding the interactions among aggregate production, income, and demand. Suppose the economy is in equilibrium. Thus, there is no pressure on output to change. Now, if demand increases at each level of output, say due to increase in government spending, firms respond to this increase by increasing production without any change in prices. This leads to an increase in income, since income is always equal to production. Increase in income will lead to further increase in demand and production. This process will continue till a new equilibrium output is reached. Section 3.1, the composition of GDP. If we want to understand what determines the demand for goods, it makes sense to decompose aggregate output, GDP, from the point of view of the different goods being produced and from the point of view of the different buyers for these goods. Consumption, C, represents spending on final goods and services by consumers such as clothing, restaurant maids, and haircuts. Investment I represents fixed investment spending on non-residential and residential buildings and equipment such as a company building a factory or buying a machine. Government spending G represents purchases of goods and services by the federal, state, and local governments such as government spending on roads, bridges, consultants, teachers, excluding government transfers such as welfare payments or spending on social security.
the composition of GDP continued. Exports, X, represent purchases of U.S. goods and services by foreigners, such as foreigners spending money at Disney World in Florida or buying a car made in the U.S. Imports, IM, represent purchases of foreign goods and services by U.S. consumers, firms, and the U.S. government, such as clothing made in China, machines made in Germany, or Americans spending money on foreign travel. Net exports or trade balance is given by X minus IM. The difference between exports and imports is called net exports, X minus IM, or the trade balance. If exports exceed imports, the country is said to run a trade surplus. If exports are less than imports, the country is said to run a trade deficit. In 2018, U.S. exports accounted for 12.4% of GDP. U.S. imports were equal to 15.4% of GDP. So the United States was running a trade deficit equal to 3% of GDP. Inventory investment is the difference between production and sales. It is added to fixed investment to get the figure of actual investment as opposed to planned investment. The decomposition of GDP, which we shall denote by the letter Y, when we use algebra throughout this book, typically used by macroeconomists, is shown in Table 3.1. A more detailed version with precise definitions appears in Appendix 1 at the end of the book. I highly recommend that you read it carefully. The composition of U.S. GDP in 2018, as shown in Table 3.1, reveals that 1. Consumption C is the largest component of GDP, Y, accounting for 68%. 2. Investment, I, accounted for 17.5% of GDP. 3. Government spending, G, accounted for 17.2% of GDP. 4. Net exports, X minus IM, accounted for minus 3.0% of GDP. And five, inventory investment accounted for 0.2% of GDP. If production exceeds sales and firms accumulate inventories as a result, then inventory investment is said to be positive. If production is less than sales and firms' inventories fall, then inventory investment is said to be negative. Inventory investment is typically small, positive in some years and negative in others. In 2018, inventory investment was positive, equal to $56 billion. Put another way, production was higher than sales by an amount equal to $56 billion. Section 3.2, the demand for goods. We now have what we need to develop our first model of output determination, the Keynesian cross model. Denote the total demand for goods by Z. Using the decomposition of GDP we saw in section 3.1, we can write Z as shown on the slide. Z equals C plus I plus G plus X minus IM. The above identity defines the total demand for goods Z as consumption plus investment plus government spending. We now have to think about the determinants of Z. To make the task easier, 
Let's make a number of simplifications. Assumption of the Keynesian cross model. Assume 1. All firms produce the same good which can then be used for consumption or investment or by the government. With this big simplification, we need to look at only one market, the market for the good, and think about what determines supply and demand in that market. 2. Firms are willing to supply any amount of the good at a given price level B. This is drastically different from the classical economics where wages and prices are considered to be flexible in the short run and long run. To understand the significance of this assumption, please read the first few paragraphs of the article below at http colon forward slash forward slash people dot s-t-e-r-n dot n-y-u dot e-d-u forward slash n-r-o-u b-i-n-i forward slash n-o-t-e-s forward slash C-H-A-P-9 dot H-T-M. This assumption allows us to focus on the role demand plays in the determination of output. As we shall see, this assumption is valid only in the short run. In the real world, we see that prices and nominal wages tend to adjust very slowly or are sticky in the short run. When we move to the study of the median run, we shall abandon it. 3. In a closed economy, X equals IM equals 0. So the demand for goods Z is simply the sum of consumption, investment, and government spending. Z equals C plus I plus G. Let us discuss each of the three components in turn. Consumption represented by uppercase letter C. Consumption decisions depend on many factors, but the main one is surely income, or more precisely, disposable income, represented by uppercase letter Y with subscript uppercase letter D as YD. The income that remains once consumers have received transfers from the government and paid their taxes. When their disposable income goes up, people buy more goods. When it goes down, they buy fewer goods. We can then write C equals CYD with plus sign under YD as equation 3.1. Equation 3.1 is a behavioral equation that captures the behavior of consumers. Equation 3.1 says that consumption depends on disposable income. The plus sign below indicates consumption varies positively with disposable income. The function CYD is called the consumption function. It is often useful to be more specific about the form of the function. Assume that the consumption function is a linear relation with two parameters given by lowercase c with subscript 0, i.e. c0, and lowercase c with subscript 1, i.e. c1. Equation 3.2 writes the consumption function in its linear form as c equals C0 plus C1 YD. Compare it to a linear function of the form Y equals MX plus B, where M is the slope and B is the vertical intercept. Equation 3.2 says that 1. Consumption is a linear function of disposable income. 2. The slope of the curve is given by C1. 3. C1 is the marginal propensity to consume. It is assumed that C1 lies between 0 and 1 because people t spend, tend to spend part but not all of the extra disposable income. It gives the effect 
an additional dollar of disposable income has on consumption. If C1 is equal to 0 0.6, then an additional dollar of disposable income increases consumption by $1 times 0 0.6 equals 60 cents. 4. C0 represents autonomous consumption that does not depend on disposable income. 5. C0 is what people would consume if their disposable income equals 0. How can this be? In this case, people dis-save. They consume either by selling some of their assets or by borrowing. 6. Changes in C0 reflect changes in consumption for a given level of disposable income. The relation between consumption and disposable income shown in equation 3.2 is drawn in figure 3.1. Because it is a linear relation, it is represented by a straight line. Its intercept with the vertical axis is C0. Its slope is C1. Because C1 is less than 1, the slope of the line is less than 1. Equivalently, the line is, 40, is flatter than a 45 degree line. If the value of C0 increases, then the line shifts up by the same amount. The consumption function illustrated in figure 3.1 shows that consumption increases with disposable income but less than 1 for 1. The slope of the consumption function is less than 1. The vertical intercept is determined by the value of autonomous consumption C0. A lower value of C0 will shift the consumption function down. A higher value will shift the consumption function up. If marginal propensity to consume C1 changes, it will change the slope of the curve, making it steeper or flatter. Disposable income YD is given by the identity YD equals Y minus T, where Y represents income and T represents net taxes, i.e. taxes minus transfers. Equation 3.3 rewrites the consumption function by substituting y minus t for yd. So it becomes c equals c0 plus c1 time y minus t. Equation 3.3 tells us that consumption c is a function of income y and taxes t. Higher income increases consumption but less than 1 for 1. Higher taxes decrease consumption, also less than 1 for 1. Investment, represented by the uppercase letter I. Models have two types of variables. Some variables depend on other variables in the model and are therefore explained within the model. Variables like these are called endogenous variables. This was the case for consumption given previously. Other variables are not explained within the model but are instead taken as given. Variables like these are called exogenous variables. For example, in our model we assume I equals I bar. Equation 3.4. A bar on investment means Investment is taken as given. Equation 3.4 states that investment is assumed to be given in our model. Hence, it is an exogenous variable. Y and C in our model depend on other variables and hence are endogenous variables. The third component of demand in our model is government spending, represented by uppercase letter G. T and G describe fiscal policy. 
the choice of taxes and spending by the government. G and T are exogenous because governments do not behave with the same regularity as consumers or firms. This book will typically treat G and T as variables chosen by the government and will not try to explain them within the model. Section 3.3, the determination of equilibrium output. Let's now turn to equilibrium in the goods market and the relation between production and demand. If firms hold inventory, then production need not be equal to demand. For example, firms can satisfy an increase in demand by drawing upon their inventory, by having negative inventory investment. They can respond to a decrease in demand by continuing to produce and accumulating inventory, by having positive inventory investment. Let's first ignore this complication though and begin by assuming that firms do not hold inventory. Remember that demand represented by Z is the sum of the four components C, I, G, and X minus I, M. In our simple model, net exports X minus I, M are assumed to be zero. Inventory investment is also zero. G and T are determined by the government. Y represents output, forward slash production, and income. So, Z equals C plus I plus G. Replacing C and I from equation 3.3 and 3.4, Z equals C0 plus C1 times Y minus T plus I bar plus G, equation 3.5. In short run equilibrium, Output is determined by demand. Since inventories are assumed to be e zero, equilibrium in the goods market requires that production Y be equal to the demand for goods Z. Y equal Z, equation 3.6. This equation is called an equilibrium condition. Models include three types of equations identities, behavioral equations, and equilibrium conditions. You have seen examples of each type in this chapter. Substituting equation 3.5 in equation 3.6 gives us equation 3.7. Y equals C0 plus C1 times Y minus T plus I bar plus G. In equilibrium, production Y is equal to demand Z, which in turn depends on income Y, which is itself equal to production. Note that we are using the same symbol Y for production and income. This is no accident. As you saw in chapter two, we can look at GDP either from the production side or from the income side. Production and income are identically equal. Solving a model means not only solving it algebraically, but also understanding why the results are what they are. In this book, solving a model will also mean characterizing the results using graphs, sometimes skipping the algebra altogether and describing the results and the mechanisms in words. Macroeconomists always use three tools. One, algebra to make sure that the logic is correct. Two, graphs to build the intuition. Three, words to explain the result. Having constructed a model, we can solve it to look at what determines the level of output and how output changes in response to 
clear change in government spending. Using algebra, we can solve for equilibrium output y. Rewrite equation 3.7. y equals c0 plus c1y minus c12 plus i bar plus g. Move c1y and reorganize the equation to get 1 minus c1 times y equals c0 plus i bar plus g minus c12. Divide both sides by 1 minus c1. We get y equals 1 over 1 minus c1 times c0 plus i bar plus g minus c12 as equation 3.8. Let us look at equation 3.8 again. y equals 1 over 1 minus c1 times c0 plus i bar plus g minus c12. Now focus on the two terms on the right side of the equation. 1. The term within brackets c0 plus i bar plus g minus c12 is the part of the demand for goods that does not depend on output. For this reason, it is called autonomous spending. Autonomous spending is mostly positive since C0 and I bar are positive and even if T equals G, balanced budget, and C1 is between 0 and 1, then G minus C1 T is positive. 2. The first term, 1 over 1 minus C1, is called the multiplier. The propensity to consume C1 is between 0 and 1, so 1 over 1 minus C1 is a number greater than 1. For this reason, the number which multiplies autonomous spending is called the multiplier, which is larger when C1 is closer to 1. For example, if C1 equals 0 0.6, the multiplier equals 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6 equals 2.5. What does the multiplier imply? Suppose that for a given level of income, consumers decide to consume more. Assume C0 in equation 3.3 increases by one billion dollars. Equation 3.8 tells us that output will increase by more than one billion dollars. Since the multiplier is 2.5, an increase of consumption by one billion dollars will increase output by 2.5 times one billion equals 2.5 billion dollars. We have looked at an increase in consumption but equation 3.8 makes it clear that any change in autonomous spending, from a change in investment to a change in government spending to a change in taxes, will have the same qualitative effect. It will change output by more than its direct effect on autonomous spending. Where does the multiplier effect come from? Looking back at equation 3.7, you can see that an increase in C0 increases demand. The increase in demand leads to an increase in production. The increase in production leads to an equal increase in income, since the two are identically equal. The increase in income further increases consumption, which further increases demand, and so on. The best way to describe this mechanism is to represent the equilibrium using a graph. The determination of equilibrium output steps to characterize the equilibrium graphically. 1. Plot production as a function of income. Because production equals income, their relation is the 45 degree line. 2. Plot demand 
as a function of income. Z equals C0 plus I bar plus G minus C1T plus C1Y. Three, in equilibrium, production Y equals demand Z. Figure 3.2 represents the Keynesian cross diagram. The horizontal axis represents income Y and the vertical axis represents demand Z and the production Y. The graph plots two upward sloping lines, one for demand VZ and the other for production. Plotting production as a function of income is straightforward. Recall that production and income are identically equal. Thus, the relation between them is the 45 degree line, the line with a slope equal to 1. Regarding the demand for ZZ, equation 3.5 shows that Z equals C0 plus C1 Y minus T plus I bar plus G, which can be written as Z equals C0 plus I bar plus G minus C1 T within parenthesis plus C1Y, equation 3.9, by regrouping the terms for autonomous spending together in the parenthesis. So demand curve ZZ plots demand as a function of income. They intercept with the vertical axis the value of demand when income is equal to zero equals autonomous spending. The slope of the line is the propensity to consume C1, which shows when income increases by one, demand increases by C1. Since C1 is positive but less than 1, the line is upward sloping but has a slope of less than 1. In equilibrium, production equals demand. Figure 3.2 shows that equilibrium output is determined by the condition that production be equal to demand, y equals z. Graphically, it is given by the intersection of the demand curve zz and the production line at point A. To the left of A, demand exceeds production. To the right of A, production exceeds demand. Only at A are demand and production equal with production equal to Y. Please take a moment at this point to pause and study the graph carefully. Now consider the effects of an increase in autonomous spending on equilibrium output graphically. Suppose C0 increases by $1 billion. At the initial level of income, the level of disposable income associated with point A, since T is unchanged in this example, consumers increase their consumption by $1 billion. What happens is shown in Figure 3.3, which builds on Figure 3.2. Figure 3.3 shows that an increase in autonomous spending has a more than one-for-one one effect on equilibrium output because of the working of the multiplier. Equation 3.9 tells us that for any value of income, if C0 is higher by $1 billion, demand is higher by $1 billion. Before the increase in C0, the relation between demand and income was given by the line ZZ. After the increase in C0 by $1 billion, the relation between demand and income was given by the line ZZ prime, which is parallel to ZZ but higher by $1 billion. In other words, the demand curve shifts up by $1 billion. The new equilibrium is at the intersection of the 45 degree line and the new demand relation at point A prime. Equilibrium output goes from y to y prime. The increase in output y prime minus y, which we can measure either on the horizontal axis or the vertical axis, is larger than the initial increase in consumption of $1 billion. This is the multiplier effect. Look at the vertical axis. The distance between y and y prime is larger than the distance between a and b which is equal to $1 billion. With the help of the graph, it becomes easier to tell how and why the economy moves from A to A prime.
steps shown on next slide. Steps. Distance A B shows first round increase in demand leading to an equal increase in production of $1 billion. Distance B C shows first round increase in income equal to increase in production of $1 billion. Distance C D shows second round increase in demand equals $1 billion, the increase in income in the first round times the propensity to consume C1, hence C1 billion dollars. Distance DE shows second round increase in production and income. The third increase in demand equals C1 billion dollars, the increase in income in the second round, times C1, the marginal propensity to consume. It is equal to C1 dollars times C1 equals C1 squared billion dollars and so on. The total increase in production after, say n plus 1 rounds, equals 1 billion dollars times the sum 1 plus c1 plus c1 squared plus 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 so on till c1 raised to power n, which is a geometric series with the property that when c1 is less than 1, as it is here, and n gets larger and larger, the sum keeps increasing but approaches a limit of 1 over 1 minus c1, making the eventual increase in output 1 over 1 minus c1 billion dollars. The expression 1 over 1 minus c1 is the multiplier derived another way. This gives a more intuitive way of thinking about the multiplier. We can think of the original increase in demand triggering successive increases in production which with each increase in production leading to an increase in income which leads to increase in demand which leads to further increase in production and so on the multiplier is the sum of all these successive increases in production to summarize our findings using words Production depends on demand, which depends on income, which is itself equal to production. An increase in demand leads to an increase in production and income, which in turn leads to a further increase in demand. The increase in equilibrium output is larger than the initial shift in demand by a factor equal to the multiplier. The multiplier depends on the propensity to consume which can be estimated using econometrics, the set of statistical methods used in economics. To give you a sense of what econometrics is and how it is used, read Appendix 3 at the end of the book. A reasonable estimate of the propensity to consume in the United States today is around 0 0.6. In other words, an additional dollar of disposable income leads to leads on average to an increase in consumption of 60 cents. This implies that the multiplier is equal to 1 over 1 minus C1 equals 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6 equals 2.5. The adjustment of output over time is called the dynamics of adjustment. How long the adjustment takes depends on how and when firms revise their production schedule. Instantaneous adjustment isn't really plausible. For example, a firm that faces an increase in demand might well decide to wait before adjusting its production, meanwhile drawing down its inventories to satisfy demand. A worker who gets a pay raise might not adjust her consumption right away. These delays imply that the adjustment of output will take time. How long the adjustment takes depends on how fast consumers respond to changes in income and how fast firms respond to changes in sales. Focus. The Lehman bankruptcy 
fears of another Great Depression and shifts in the consumption function. What might cause the consumption function to shift down? Why would consumers decrease consumption if their disposable income has not changed? Or, in terms of equation 3.2, why might C0 decrease, leading in turn to a decrease in demand, output, and so on? One of the first reasons that come to mind is that, even if their current income has not changed, consumers start worrying about the future and decide to save more. One example we can talk about is the Lehman bankruptcy and how it led to fears of another Great Depression and shifts in the consumption function. When people start worrying about the future, they decide to save more even if their current income has not changed. News about Lehman Brothers going bankrupt in September 2008 reminded people of the Great Depression as confirmed by the number of searches for Great Depression in Google. Consumption fell even if disposable income had not changed. This caused the consumption function to shift down. Figure 1 plus from the first quarter of 2008 to the third quarter of 2009 the behavior of three variables, disposable income, total consumption, and consumption of durables, the part of consumption that falls on goods such as cars, computers, and so on. To make things visually simple, all three variables are normalized to equal one in the first quarter of 2008. Note two things about the figure. First, even though the crisis led to a large fall in GDP during that period, disposable income did not initially move much. It even increased in the first quarter of 2008. But consumption was unchanged from the first to the second quarter and then fell before disposable income fell. It fell by 3 percentage points in 2009 relative to 2008, more than the decrease in disposable income. In terms of figure 1, the distance between the line for disposable income and consumption increased. Second, during the third and especially the fourth quarters of 2008, the consumption of durables dropped sharply. It was down 10%, not 10 percentage points, relative to the first quarter be before recovering briefly in early 2009 and then decreasing again. For most people, the main sign of trouble was what they read in newspapers. Even though they still had their job and received their monthly income checks, the events reminded them of the story of the Great Depression and the pain that came with it. One way to see this is to look at the Google Trends series that gives the number of searches for Great Depression from January 2008 to September 2009 and is plotted in Figure 2. In Figure 2, the graph peaks at 3.1 on October 5, 2008, and then decreasing slowly over the course of 2009, as it became clear that, while the crisis was a serious one, policymakers were going to do whatever they could to avoid a repeat of the Great Depression. Section 3.4, investment equals saving, an alternative way of thinking about goods market equilibrium. Thus far, we have been thinking of equilibrium in the goods market in terms of the equality of the production and the demand for goods. An alternative, but it turns out, equivalent way of thinking about equilibrium focuses instead on investment and saving. This is how John Maynard Keynes first articulated this model in 1936 in the General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. To understand the investment equals saving equilibrium condition, start by understanding the definition of private saving and public saving. Private saving, represented by uppercase letter S, 
is equal to disposable income YB minus consumption spending C or Y minus T minus C. By definition, public saving equals T minus G, where T equals taxes minus transfers. If T is greater than G, public saving is positive and there is a budget surplus. If T is less than G, public saving is negative and there is a budget deficit. To derive the investment equal savings relation, start from the fact that in equilibrium, y equals c plus i plus g. Subtract t from both sides and move c to the left side to get y minus t minus c equals i plus g minus t. The left side of the equation is simply s. So, s equals i plus g minus t or equivalently, i equals s plus within brackets t minus g as equation 3.10. Equation 3.10 gives us another way of thinking about equilibrium in the goods market. It says that equilibrium in the goods market requires that investment equal saving, the sum of private and public saving. This is why the equilibrium condition in the goods market is called the IS relation which stands for investment equals saving. What firms want to invest, I, must be equal to what people and government want to save, S plus within bracket T minus G. In a modern economy, however, investment decisions are made by firms, whereas saving decisions are made by consumers and the government. In equilibrium, equation 3.10 tells us all these decisions have to be cons consistent. Investment must equal saving. So two equivalent ways of stating the condition for equilibrium in the goods market are that production Y equals demand Z and investment equal saving. We derive the equilibrium output using the first condition y equals z and found that equilibrium output is given by equation 3.8 as shown below y equals 1 over 1 minus c1 times within bracket c0 plus i bar plus g minus c1t we now do the same using the second condition i equals s plus within bracket t minus g. The result will be the same, but the derivation will give you another way of thinking about the equilibrium. Remember that consumption and saving decisions are one and the same. Given their disposable income, once consumers have chosen consumption, their saving is determined and vice versa. The way we specify consumption behavior implies that private saving is given by S equals Y minus T minus C equals Y minus T minus C0 minus C1 times Y minus T. Rearranging we get S equals minus C0 plus within bracket 1 minus C1 times within bracket Y minus T. The, as equation 3.11. Equation 3.11 is the behavioral equation showing the saving function. Savings are negative minus C0 when disposable income Y minus T is 0. Slope of the saving function is given by 1 minus C1 which is equal to the marginal propensity to save NPS. Marginal propensity to save lies between 0 and 1. The propensity to save tells us how much of an additional unit of income people save. Private saving increases with disposable income but less than $1 for each additional dollar of disposable income. Marginal propensity to consume NPC plus marginal propensity to save NPS 
equals 1. NPC plus NPS equals 1. Substituting the saving function in the IS relation and solving for y gives us equation 3.12. In equilibrium, I equals S, so that equation 3.10 becomes I equals minus C0 plus within bracket 1 minus C1 times within bracket Y minus T plus within bracket T minus G. Solve for output y equals 1 over 1 minus c1 times within bracket c0 plus i bar plus g minus c1 t equation 3.12 equation 3.12 is exactly the same as equation 3.8 this should come as no surprise we're looking at the same equilibrium conditions just in a different way this alternative way will prove useful in various applications later in the book. The, the focus box, the paradox of saving, looks at such an application which was first emphasized by Keynes. The equilibrium value of y obtained here is exactly the same as we got by using the production equals demand or y equals z equation. Focus, the paradox of saving. We are told about the virtues of thrift as we grow up, but the model in this chapter tells a different story. Suppose that consumers decide to save more, so C0 decreases. What will happen to output and to saving? Equation 3.12 implies that output decreases. Saving will return to the original level or stay unchanged at the previous level since i, g, and t have not changed by assumption. Proof. Remember that s equals minus c0 plus within bracket 1 minus c1 times within bracket y minus t. Equation 3.11. Using equation 3.11 for private saving s, we can see that when consumers increase saving minus c0 term, will be higher, less negative. This tends to increase saving, but on the other hand, the income Y is lower because production is lower. If consumers decide to save more and hence consume less at each level of disposable income, autonomous consumption C0 decreases. This decreased consumption decreases demand, which decreases production. Equation 3.12 for equilibrium income implies that income will decline by a multiple of that fall. This decreases saving. The net result would seem to be ambiguous, but in fact, we can tell which way it goes. To see how, look at equation 3.10, the equilibrium condition that investment and saving must be equal. I equals S plus T minus G. Equation 3.10. By assumption, investment does not change since I equals I bar, equation 3.4, nor do T or G. So S must remain unchanged. In equilibrium, saving will return to the original level or stay unchanged at the previous level. Although people want to save more at a given level of income, the income decreases by an amount such that their saving is unchanged. This surprising pair of results is known as the paradox of saving or the paradox of thrift. Note that the same result would obtain if we looked at public rather than private saving. A decrease in the budget deficit would also lead to a lower output and unchanged overall public and private saving. And note that if we extended our model to allow investment to decrease with output rather than assuming it is constant, the result would be more dramatic and attempt to save more either by consumers or by the government would lead to lower output, lower investment and by implication lower saving. 
So should the government tell people to be less thrifty? No. The result the results of this simple model are of much relevance in the short run. The desire of consumers to save more is an important factor in many of the US recessions including as we saw in the previous example during the financial crisis. In the medium run and long run, other mechanisms come into play all the time and an increase in saving rate is likely to lead over time to higher saving and higher income. Warning, policies that encourage saving might be good in the medium run and in the long run, but in the short run, they can lead to a reduction in demand and in output and perhaps even a recession in the short run. Section 3.5. Is the government omnipotent? A warning. Equation 3.8 given below implies that the government can choose the level of G or T to affect the level of output it wants. Y equals 1 over 1 minus C1 times within bracket C0 plus I bar plus G minus C1 T. So suppose government wanted to increase output by $1 billion, all it needs to do is to increase G by 1 minus C1 billion dollars. This increase in government spending, in theory, will lead to an increase of 1 minus C1 billion dollars times the multiplier 1 over 1 minus C1 or 1 billion dollars. However, there are many aspects of reality that we have not incorporated in our model. Changing G or T is not easy. Getting the Congress to pass bills always takes time. Implementing what is in the bill, bills takes even more time. Chapters 21 and 22 discuss that. Investment and imports may change, making it hard for governments to assess the effects of their policies. Some of the increased demand by consumers and firms will not be for domestic goods, but foreign goods, discussed in chapters 5, 9, and 18 to 20. Expectations are likely to matter. For example, the reactions of consumers to a tax cut is likely to depend on whether they think of the tax cut as transitory or permanent. The more they perceive the tax as permanent, the larger will be their consumption response. Chapters 14 to 16. Achieving a given level of output can come with unpleasant side effects. Trying to achieve too high a level of output can, for example, lead to increase in inflation and for that reason be unsustainable in the medium run. Chapter 9. Cutting T or increasing G can lead to large budget deficits and public debt in the long run. A large debt has adverse effects in the long run. This is a hot issue today in almost every advanced country in the world. Chapters 9, 11, 16, and 22 discuss that. In short, the proposition that, by using a fiscal policy, the government can affect demand and output in the short run is an important and correct proposition. But, as we refine our analysis, we will see that the role of government in general and the successful use of fiscal policy in particular become increasingly difficult. Governments will never have it so good as they have had it in this chapter.